Hey everyone, welcome to uh, week 13, day four on our gouache week. So on Monday, we painted fair with uh, my jacket on. Tuesday, we painted my sister, blonde hair, blue shirt. I really like that painting. Yesterday, we painted my sister's dog, a uh, dog I love too. I, I got him when he was a puppy. So for the first uh, few weeks, he, he was uh, with me and he is the devil. He's the devil. His name is Tyson. He he didn't know it, but he he you know. <laughs> I think that name fits him perfectly. But he's an amazing dog. Uh, sheds a lot, but he's absolutely incredible. Si no sé, that's curiosos. And I was happy because I integrated some of the uh, surrounding color with the um, with the central sort of figure that I was painting. And I'm happy too because I was able to leave some areas kind of unfinished, very washy, very transparent, and coupled with opaque areas where I centered my interest. So I'm thinking that that's what's kind of working for me. Uh, today I'm going to try to work a bunch of areas a little more opaquely and see how I do. So let's get to it. Uh, gouache week, day four. Okay, let's get started with uh, day four. To give you guys a sort of report on what I think I've learned from these past uh, three days and specifically what the experiences were with the uh, last painting, here's a little summary. I think yesterday it was, it was pretty cool because I gave myself the opportunity to paint Tyson in an atmosphere, which I hadn't done. I actually like the fact that I can isolate all the shapes in gouache for some reason I think there's an immediacy to gouache that I really, really like and that I'm leaning towards that gives me the chance to focus on shapes, on the shapes of things. And obviously by isolating the central character, the subject matter of, of my paintings, then I can concentrate on those shapes and not be worried about what the color they're up against is. So. It's one less of a relationship I have to deal with, one less of a color relationship. So that makes it a little bit easier. But I actually really, really enjoy isolating. Like I said, contours are some of my favorite, favorite things. That's one of the things that I connected with the most when I was studying. This again, thanks to Sam Martin. He's an incredible teacher. Like I said in, a, in an earlier video, he would just say shapes, 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 and he would repeat that. And I remember the example he gave to us was that if we were walking down the street and we had the sun in our face, so we were walking towards, let's say, like a sunset maybe, and there were people in front of us, you know, pretty far ahead, we would still be able to recognize everything that made up what they were, if they were holding a bag, if they had a backpack, if they had a beanie, if they had a, you know, a cap, like a baseball cap, what sort of jacket they're wearing, if they had a coat. And he told us that as an example that, you know, because we, we were only able to discern the silhouettes from basically looking at something that was backlit, that that was the power of shapes. Shapes can actually communicate with efficacy and, and strength very, very quickly. His way of making us be conscious about that power was to always, always go from the outside in, just to think of contour, contour, and then think of the inner shapes that were causing that contour. So the contour happens because the inner shapes are actually describing it. So we would go from outside in. There's a ton of people that actually speak about working from the inside out, but Sam actually emphasized it, and Sam being a product of like 50s, 60s, 70s illustration, where that was a must. The understanding and the exalting the power of contours and shapes was just everywhere in 60s and 70s illustration. So that was his education, and that's what he taught. And I am forever grateful for him for emphasizing the, the strength and value in shapes. So like I said... By isolating my subject matter, I was giving myself like an easier time to have access to the power of that contour. But with yesterday's painting, I'm happy that I told myself, okay, but let's just put something in an atmosphere. Let's surround Tyson with color just to know that I'm not doing this because I'm trying to be lazy. I'm doing it because it's a choice. It's a conscious choice to push something that I enjoy. 
And I did it and I'm very happy. I think I had some missteps yesterday, uh, mainly due to composition. I wasn't too preoccupied with having cut Tyson's legs on the right side. Sometimes this idea about not cropping the subject matter that has the most hierarchy in our picture is something that I'm not super keen on. I just think that that's a rule that has been there forever. And we are so accustomed to seeing our central characters, our central subject matter, be perfectly placed within these parameters of the picture plane. And like I said in an earlier video, Philip Perlstein is somebody who does that constantly, just crops the figure in really, really weird places. But I think nowadays, I mean, there are so, so many ways to um, understand composition that doesn't have to be just the classical way it was understood, that I think it's interesting when we give ourselves the chance to explore what happens if we push a figure to one side, to the bottom, to the top, and if we cut it in places that we don't think respond to what traditional composition would tell us to do. So I'm happy that I let myself cut off his hind legs to the right, but I also realized I can't have all my attention on those legs. I don't want it to compete because in the picture plane, in terms of it having depth, um, I didn't want the legs that were a little bit farther back to be competing with Tyson's head and his front legs. So I wasn't too concerned about cropping them. I knew that the way I could work around that was just not giving them a ton of detail. So just, just putting the initial wash and then just letting that be the way they were going to be ultimately resolved. And I was happy about that. That also means that I have to be careful from the first moment I put a wash down. I just can't be too hesitant. I have to know that even though it's a first initial wash and, you know, at times we don't really give those initial decisions enough weight. Well, these had to have weight because they had to be very clean, very clear. They had to speak about drawing also. They had to also hint at the mass of the leg just turning in space. So just a few notes, a few well-placed notes that were very transparent, very washy, would be just great. And that's what I did, and I was very happy because I think it worked really well. What I was very displeased with was that I didn't really compose my picture well. I could have, this is, again, armchair quarterback. This is just thinking after the fact. I really could have placed Tyson way up higher in the picture plane so as to have like a really nice bottom area. It would activate the floor, the wooden floorboard really nice. But I didn't do that. I put him like right smack in the middle of the uh, picture. So what I was left with was a bunch of air up top and a bunch of air in the bottom. And it just didn't work. So I had to crop it. So I had to tell myself, come on, you know better. Just don't make those dumb mistakes again. Just because I don't really feel it's cheating. But I think composing after the fact that you've painted something, it lends itself to creating a atmosphere where you're a little bit lazy, where you can just tell yourself, oh, I'll just crop it. Oh, I'll just crop it here, crop it here. But if you have a set parameter and if you have set proportions and you work within those proportions right from the start and you have an intent and you have to accommodate every decision that you're making towards that intent, then it's actually far, far better. It's far, far better as a painter to do that, I feel. That makes you respect your dimensions far more than just saying, I'll just cut a piece of canvas or I'll just add a piece of canvas <laughs> a la Freud. Uh, but anyways, so I thought I was very satisfied because I gave myself the chance to see how my subject matter would relate to the colors that were surrounding it and how or if I could create an atmosphere that would work. And I think it did. I was quite, quite happy with how the painting came out. There's a freshness, there's a looseness to it, there's a sketchy quality to it that I really, really like. But for today, I wanted to go back to that attraction I'm feeling towards this very monolithic shape that is void of atmosphere, of space. I just like it. It's, it's just like an easy bullseye where you can say, okay, this, this floating piece of colored shape is what I'm supposed to look. Oof, more so than oils, for some reason, I just feel gouache just lends itself really, really beautifully to float something there that just immediately grabs your attention. I'm painting a former student of mine and a friend, I would say, Gabi and her cat. And... And I just loved the the really weird quality that this had. It's her personality entirely. I just think she always felt a sense of 
discomfort with just the traditional art world. We empathize with liking what is terribly, terribly worded as outsider art or art brute. I've never really liked the manner in which we've tried to refer to these artists. I think they're artists and that's it, period. We don't even have to say, well, you know, she was autistic or she was actually considered mentally disabled. I really don't see how any of that uh, serves any purpose. For me, and it's almost like anecdotally, it's a reminder. And again, this is something that that I think we shared with uh, with Gabi, that it just makes you think about the origin of art. It makes you think about why we do things because, and my argument has always been super simple. Many of these artists have had histories with autism and they have never been aware of what it means to make art. They never made art because they wanted to be in a gallery or because they wanted to socialize art. Uh, they didn't want to share it. Many times the work that they had done is discovered posthumously. So it's very, very strange that drive, that desire to make art doesn't really answer to any human construct because art is a human construct and, and contemporary art or the way we understand the art market nowadays or how we socialize artwork, be it by galleries or museums or by uh, social media, by Instagram or Facebook or whatever, you know, however we decide to share artwork, this is something that we constructed. But when you get access to this person that is physically, physically unable to care or understand what art means or how art is supposed to be created or the reason behind the creation of artwork, and yet they still make what we as a species have defined as art, then it just boggles your mind because why are they doing stuff? What's the reason behind making a drawing, making a painting? Why? I remember introducing the uh, work of James Castle to uh, Gawi, and she absolutely connected with him and his life, and we shared mutual admiration for Castle. And Castle did the strangest things. He would set up shows for himself in a barn. He would set up his pictures like they were a gallery in the barn. But the thing is, he was never conscious of what a gallery was or how pictures were exhibited. There was nothing like that in, in his brain, and yet he did it. Uh, so it's so, so strange. It's, it's just such an incredible thing to, to have the, um, the blessing, I think, of having the opportunity to see works of art created by people that could care less about what the word art means. I just find that fascinating. And I think that that sense of inefficacy, there is a pointless quality to it. Because if you really think about it, we would just be building upon something that is intrinsic to us as a species, that it's instinctual, that it is there, even if we had no word for it. So we don't have to organize it in these strange and overly complicated dynamics for it to exist. It already exists. It, it exists beyond us. So there is like a, a, a pointless kind of nature to us trying to reorganize it in some way. I thought that when she posted herself uh, with her cat just wrapping himself around her, it's almost like her cat is wearing her as an accessory. And I love that. I just love that. This is not like a mink coat, a piece of fur that you wear as a scarf. This is a, a sentient scarf that is wearing a human being. And we all know that that's what cats are. They own this world. They have a plan. They're going to survive us all. And they're terrible. <laughs> so I thought that that was going to be fun just having Gabby there posing like that and just giving her like a sort of Roger Ballin look like something is somewhat off in this picture I thought that was great and for today because I know I've mentioned a ton of artists but because I'm trying to contextualize what we're doing with a little bit of, of, of artists that have worked with gouache I'm just going to mention for I don't know it's not going to be the uh, last time I mention him. I think Ruprecht von Kaufmann. Um, Ruprecht is the... <sighs> I was I was kind of thinking how to word this. Because in my gut, I want to say he is the best painter alive. Truly do believe so. But then I think Antonio Lopez is still alive. And Antonio Lopez has had ugh, so much impact over what I consider the purest form of painting, that to me, he's like, oh, he's almost like bigger than life. I almost think of him as an old master. Like I think of Velázquez or Van Dyck or Rembrandt. 
I also think of Antonio Lopez, which is kind of weird to know that he's still alive. So I'm just going to say that RVK is the coolest painter alive. And to me, there is something just huge about me defining in, in this way. Because for me, coolness is just about moving a person to like, you know, the, where your knees buckle. And every time I see one of his paintings, I just gasp and say, oh my God, this is so freaking cool. He has this power over me where every time I see a painting, it's like, I wish I would have done that. I think as I've grown older, I feel that less and less and less. But with Ruprecht, he just constantly, he's like the better version of myself. So every time I look at something that he did, I'm like, oh, I wish, I wish, I wish. And um, longing for pictures that don't belong to you is not great. We shouldn't grow out of it. We should just celebrate those people that are just inherently better than us. And that's what happens to me. He's incredible. So he does these gouaches and standalone gouaches. Some of them are studies for paintings, for larger paintings that he does. Because, I mean, when Ruprecht does a large painting, he does a freaking enormous painting. But anyways, some of these are studies for paintings, which I find just fascinating, just the way his brain sort of tries to figure things out uh, when he's doing gouache. And others are standalone. They are just meant to work as gouaches. There's this sense of purity. There's not a feeling of them being overworked. It's just like this instant access to color and shapes and drawings and storytelling. One of the things that I find most fascinating about Ruprecht, and perhaps this is why I think he's the best painter alive, is that there is a narrative to what he does, and I love it. I'm not afraid of that narrative. I don't shy away from artists that want to tell stories. I love them because I am an illustrator at heart, so... Whenever I see another person just wanting to tell a story, and his stories are just fantastical and fascinating, but they are also grounded, that I just, ugh, it's perfect. It's just perfect painting for me. I just think that when we're able to see how he works with gouache, with the immediacy of gouache, it just opens another door into how his brain works and how his picture-making decisions are constructed. When you can peek into an artist's brain, Oh my God, that's a blessing. Those things are invaluable for us as human beings. I, I was going to say as painters, but now as human beings, just seeing how those gears turn, you know, it's an opportunity that we should all be grateful for. So that was it for today. Just asking myself a lot of questions about the value of art through uh, representing a friend that's a wonderful, wonderful artist and, and has also a great spirit and a challenging mind. I'm happy that I had the chance to paint Gabi. So that's it. That's it for today. Join us tomorrow for our last gouache day, Friday, last day. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.